I've known Father Jonathan Robinson for over 40 years. Until to his death, he has laid great value on the true oratorian principles for his community, which today is well known for being most observant to the oratorian ways of prayer, life, and work in common. For the sake of the oratory, he was ready to leave Montreal, his beloved city of birth, and together with the First Fathers move, on invitation of the Archbishop of Toronto, to the present hometown of the congregation. Father Robinson has been an important priest and mover in modern Catholic life. His work as writer, educator, and founder of the Toronto Oratory will in future surely be appraised by competent biographers. I keep him in dear memory as an exemplary priest who totally gave up his life to Christ and has served the Church with all his manifold abilities. In truth, he was a man of prayer and decision, a good father to his community and a loyal friend. Requiescat in pace, and may God reward his faithfulness to him. So I, I did, my first experience of him was being placed, more so then than at any point since, um, uh, placed in, in the blinding light of, of a real intellect. Now this is Canada, you don't expect people to manifest intellect. Um, but there was the genuine article. One of the things which made him an extremely good um, confessor, spiritual director, um, was his ability to trust people. Um, uh, I think sometimes in a very unusual way he would shame people into telling him the truth. Why? How did he do that? By trusting them. Until they realized they were being trusted. And then the shame of having even tried to mislead him would undo the, the, the resistance to him. You know, he had an, a number of very good spiritual tricks like this which were so good because they weren't tricks. Um, Extremely gentle as a confessor, at least that was my experience of him. And the kind of, many times the frustration of, you know, coming back and, you know, having to confess the, almost the same kind of sin again and again and again. And his, his kind of remarks were, you know, no discouragement, begin again. Or another one was, um, just remember, Jason, you know, God loves you. He's not out to get you. What he did, both in confession and in the conversation, which became apparent to me as I thought about this, was that he sort of receded. He was there, but only as to create a space that would allow me to encounter my real self, my deepest self, that was in many ways very wounded and flawed. And that... Um, and that he would recede and that somehow in being able to bring myself forward into that space, I would also, in some ways, he would make room for God somehow, just by his very presence. I knew he was letting me hear myself and encounter God, both through confession and in talking to him. I think one of the reasons why the father was, was um, a very effective priest and spiritual director for certain kinds of people um, I mean, I think for, for many different kinds of people, but for, but for one kind in particular, the source of his effectiveness lay in the fact that um, he, he understood from within the nature of the difficulties with the faith, intellectual and perhaps emotional or, or affective difficulties with the faith. He understood what one might call the, 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 the possibility of doubt and the nature of the perseverance of faith, um, um, of the perseverance in God's providence and in his love, which is kind of faith's answer to the, um, to the fear and anxiety of, 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 of its untruth. For many years uh, from the 19th century, there were only three oratorians who had been beatified. This is in addition, of course, to St. Philip. But Blessed Sebastian was a little bit um, 
more recent, and in some ways uh, his character is a bit more, uh, is closer to sort of a modern character. Um, he suffered from sort of doubts and, uh, and temptations, which with the grace of God he successfully dealt with. Um, but in a way which you don't sort of see in the earlier Oratorian saints and holy holy fathers. Um, so I think he I think that was part of why he had a sort of sympathy sympathetic relation to um, Blessed Sebastian. It was through Newman that he came to St Philip, but it might be the other way around. Um, if it is the other way around, I don't know. What, what his sort of path to St. Philip was. But my suspicion is that it was through Newman. And, and my suspicion is that it was through Newman because Newman was very important to him early on as, um, among other things, a thinker who addressed um, the relationship between certainty and difficulty in the life of faith. So, Father Robinson had a, a profound love for Newman and in his and Newman was the founder of the English Oratorians. Um, and I think Father Robinson felt a very great kinship to Newman well before the Oratorian thing became a reality. I mean, he published on Newman in the 50s, several articles about Newman in the 50s. Um, and he said, you know, that Newman helped me to believe. And Newman helped me to keep my faith. Uh, one of the seminarians, who's now a priest, said to me, oh, Father Robinson reminds me of Newman, that if Newman were alive today, this is kind of what he would be like. And I told this to Father Robinson, thinking he would be kind of flattered by it, I thought, or I'm not sure why I told him, but I did. And he said, oh, well, I wish he had said that I reminded him of St. Philip. <laughs> um, Father Robinson used to say, and this is something I never fully understood and still don't understand exactly. Sometimes he says, I find it easier to believe in St. Philip than in God. Uh, well, the first time I met with him, when I was considering joining, um, I remember I didn't hold anything back from him about my concerns, about uh, my problems, about what I thought of the place, good and bad. Um, well, I remember, well, he actually, he asked me a question. He said, do you think I'm aloof? He said, and I said, yeah, I, th I do think you're aloof. I think you're aloof. And I think, I think you're cold, sort of what I said to him. Um, and he always, he, something about the fathers, he always appreciated frankness. And he was a very direct man, almost blunt sometimes. I mean, he was a gentleman, but he was also someone who appreciated frankness and candidness in conversation. He wasn't someone to sort of paper over things or sugarcoat things. So we had a very blunt conversation. Um, and I ended up asking him about his father's death in that conversation, of course, that conversation. It came up somehow. And I didn't know that the father, that his father had died when he was very young. Not, well, not very young. He was something like 20, like late, late teens maybe. Um, and I remember him telling me it was very, the conversation got very intense because then he told me the story of his conversion. The emphasis he put upon his father's death, um, firstly, and secondly, upon the incarnation as for a long time an obstacle to a kind of deeper participation in Christianity. Um, um, and one which was, was eventually, in a way, overcome in his, in his conversion to the church. Um, but he also says that, in a way, the difficulty wasn't overcome, but just somehow sort of resituated. And the reason I think those two things are interesting, those two kind of landmarks, the, the, the very personal matter of his father's premature death, and then the very speculative question of the incarnation, I, th I think that they're related in, in a... In a, in a in a way um, which can be teased out. Something like this, that, that his father's death had given him a, a, a very deep
deep sense of the fragility of human life and of the kind of the vanity of human ambition. And I think that the, 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 the sudden disappearance of his father from his life marked him in, in a certain way with a, with, a, with a pessimism and an anxiety about human life and a, a sense of its um, transience and, and the way in which it's subject to sudden and irreparable reversals of fortune or, or draining of a loss of purpose even. And the connection of that with, with the inca to the incarnation, I think, is that the obstacle for the father in the incarnation was precisely the, the af affirmation at the heart of the incarnation that God cares enough about the world to have entered into its flesh and into its destiny and its vicissitudes. And I think that that, that, that idea that God was sufficiently related to the world and related to it mercifully and compassionately was something that the father um, struggled with. He had been run over by a trolley instead of made a priest in 1962. He could still report reasonably full life that had been lived through then, a life of intellectual and moral striving that, that had completed one circuit by the time he became a priest in 62. He was, what, 33 years old at that point. Um, so he, he, uh, he didn't entirely come from the world before Vatican II, which is just when it's all happening. Just, you know, almost the ideal worst time to be joining um, the priesthood. But, but he was, um, in the moment of becoming a priest, in the moment of Vatican II and all that stuff in the 60s, he was almost consciously stepping out of a world from which he came and in which he would be naturally comfortable into our brave new world. He had actually been in the Dominican order. Although he, he only lasted for the novitiate, I believe he left. There were various circumstances that transpired where he ended up leaving before um, simple vows. But it's, it's an experience that, that he always spoke as being very kind of formative and important for him. And um, there was no kind of animus about it. It was, it was a kind of, I think, very clear that it just wasn't his path, even though he had a great admiration for the vocation of the Dominican preacher. He was already studying in Europe, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he eventually enter, entered the kind of English problems. I got to know some of those very uh, interesting um, sort of mid-century English Dominicans, um, Victor White and another would be Cornelius Ernst. These were important people for him. These two that were both um, theologians who quite explicitly sought enrichment to theological speech and thought from outside of its conventional boundaries. Do you have a sense of who his favorite spiritual writer was? Um, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? <laughs> so at times it was um, St. Catherine of Siena. Um, he did, of course, um, both of the great, the great Carmelites, St. Teresa of Avila, perhaps a bit more than St. John of the Cross. So he had sort of this great interest in, in, in uh, the Spanish mystics. Same thing with the Laude of Jacopo Donatori, an Italian for the spiritual combat. Certainly that was something that, uh, that I, th I think he picked up a bit later than some of the other better known sort of classics and, uh, and, then, and then stuck with it and loved it and obviously wrote a book based on it. I think at some level he always felt himself to be an exile, of course in the Christian sense an exile from heaven uh, and also in a sense an exile from 
Anglo-Quebec and his father's world that he uh, had felt himself almost expelled from. Uh, Father Robinson was uh, achieved many things, including the foundation of this institution, um, and was granted, I think, many victory, unlikely victories um, in, in his tasks here. Um, but he was conscious of having uh, le it, 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 I should word this carefully because uh, he was not preferred. He had the character and the mind to, in another period in history, have gone very high up in the church. This was sort of Parkdale. You can go to Parkdale. You know, it's just one loop up from, you can go to hell. Um, the, um, uh, and he built and he built here in the most unlikely circumstances. Um, full commitment to the oratory, such as he had made, um, had led him away from paths of worldly success, uh, whether those paths be ecclesiastical, um, um, triumph, um, or, 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 or um, uh, other kinds. Um, and um, he, it, was, it was ambivalent for him, in a way, because he, he remained alive to the, to the um, um, attraction of the exercise of power. Um, so it would be wrong, I think, to represent him as a, as a kind of somebody who had cheerfully and heroically um, entirely detached from that allure. But he had persevered in a path which he, he understood from early on would take him away from it. And um, he was somebody who lived with tensions, I think, in himself. Um, um, but he did live with it and, 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 and found a way of living with it. Um, so the path of Amari and Ashiri, the path of this relative retirement and seclusion, and even marginalization in some ways, I think he would say, had not been easy and didn't ever become so, I don't think. Though perhaps in later years he came to be able to see um, um, and to feel more um, fully um, what the advantages had been for him in being diverted, or perhaps he would say sometimes even rescued. I met Father um, in 1973, January uh, 1973. I was at choir practice, and someone said, Father Robinson wants to speak to you. And so Father Jonathan uh, said I should join the prayer group uh, that he was starting, and so I did. Uh, he later said that he was sure I had a vocation when I described him as a, a nondescript old man. He was 45, prematurely silver. He'd been blonde as a, as, a, as, a, as a boy. He said, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but never that. In the prayer group, uh, there were six or eight of us. We met every second week. Uh, we had mass at St. Patrick's all of us sitting in the sanctuary, a dialogue homily, which was not expected of Father Robinson, and then re refreshments. And I can remember the, the evening when the father announced, I want to start the oratory. So uh, uh, I was there for dinner with a few other guests. It was just a handful of people. Um, after the dinner, the father invited us to go into the sitting room, the living room that I first saw when I came into the house, and he initiated um, a discussion on spiritual matters. That, in a sense, was Little Ortree. It was what we know today as Little, little, little Ortree, but it wasn't formal. It was just a, uh, a group sitting down, um, having a discussion. And the father started to, uh, he initiated the discussion and he brought up uh, Cardinal Newman and he suggested that we read uh, Cardinal Newman's um, 
sermon. Well, well Newman is um, he's, um, quite wonderful to read to oneself, but to hear someone read it well is, is you know, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And uh, it really was um, inspiring. Um, and what followed afterwards was the Father leading us in a discussion and our reflections on, on the sermon. So my impressions were that, you know, I wasn't familiar with this kind of spiritual group. And it was certainly something that I liked very much and wanted more of. Uh, during one of our little oratories, Father David, he, um, he announced to us that he was going, going to become an oratorian. Uh, and uh, I remember <laughs> there was nervousness. Uh, he, he was a bit nervous because he kept glancing at the Father as he, as he was telling us about this. It was a big step for him. And so I was clothed with the habit of St. Philip on uh, the Feast of St. Michael and the Archangels, um, which is the novice feast, uh, on September the 29th, uh, 1975. So our house was formally erected uh, by the Holy See on November the 1st, All Saints Day, and that's one of our big feast days here. I got the news uh, from Father Napier, the provost of the London Oratory, and a longtime friend of the father's uh, on November the 2nd. And I telephoned the father, woke him up, and told him that we were an oratory. Uh, and then we had a canonical visitation. In the summer of 1978, there is a loose federation of oratories uh, with a visitor who represents the Holy Father to make sure there are no problems with our bishop, um, to make sure there are no internal conflicts. And so the visitor, a German priest from the Aachen Oratory for the Paul Turks, but out of the blue, totally unexpected, he recommended that we investigate the possibility of moving to Toronto. It was that definite. It wasn't an order, it was a recommendation, it was a suggestion. We prayed about it, talked about it, and then we did it. Well, it was kind of explosive. Um, you know, the, the, the people who, uh, who were coming to Mass in Montreal were very attached to us. And this was, uh, this was disastrous for them. I mean, they, they, a lot of them were heartbroken by this. Um, you know, because they, uh, they, were, they were invested to some extent in, in helping us. And I mean, they were there every Saturday helping us to do work that was necessary. Uh, but uh, the Father presented it to the group and why it was necessary for the growth of the oratory and why it was recommended to us by, by, the, by the apostolic visitor. You know, it was something larger than us. Two days before we left Montreal, a student from Toronto who had begun to visit us in Montreal, was clothed with the habit of St. Philip, packed up his car, and drove back to Toronto to begin community life here with us in Toronto. Uh, but that's his story, and let's let him tell it. I met Father Robinson when he, he came to Toronto in the fall of 1978. We, we met at the university campus and I think I served his Mass in the basement of St. Basil's Church at St. Michael's College in um, 1979. I went to Montreal and spent a week there and um, was very impressed. And, uh, and then after that, I guess I made up my mind that I would um, try my vocation with the oratory and went back at the beginning of summer to do the month's postulancy. The Father and uh, Father David and I, a uh, number of evenings, played Scrabble. And I nearly ruined my vocation because for some reason only known to God, I ended up winning almost every game that did not sit well, perhaps, with other members of the community. <laughs> By providence, Emmett Cardinal Carter uh, 
had just been named Archbishop of Toronto. He was a Montreal priest. He knew Father Jonathan. And so he gave us Holy Family Parish, and he said that if it didn't work, he'd give us another parish. It wasn't a plum. You know, Parkdale was, a, you might say, a rundown parish with a lot of problems. You know, a lot of um, halfway houses uh, for uh, ex-psychiatric patients. Due to a new policy in the uh, Ontario government's um, treatment of psychiatric patients, they decided that rather than have them uh, housed at, in a hospital, they would release them into the community and they would live in halfway homes to try to integrate them. And, and, and so Parkdale became uh, one of the neighborhoods where many of these uh, ex-psychiatric uh, patients were, were now living. And so a lot of them would show up at the door in the, at Holy Family. Uh, there was a lot of prostitution. There was a lot of prostitution in the neighborhood, a lot of drugs. Um, the the whole, whole business of coming to Toronto was very frightening for me. I was reluctant to come here, but I, I decided, you know, that this is, this is the life for me and this is what, what God has, uh, has chosen for us. And so I came. Uh, and, but I discovered that once we were here, I was in my element. <laughs> we just put our heads down and we went to work and we're still here uh, 40 years later. I started coming out to Holy Family for, for Mass. The Mass was reverent, beautiful, the preaching was good, the priests looked like priests, there was none of the, um, the kind of apologetics in the sense of apologizing for being Catholic that you got in a lot of Catholic churches in those days. Um, there was no dissent from the teaching of the church. It was all just solid Catholicism. But here the very first time I thought, oh, uh, this is how it's supposed to be. Um, and there was a great deal of reverence, great deal of kind of solemnity. An average Sunday would be at the 8 o'clock Mass, Father would say it, I would do confessions and communions. I would do the 9.30 and he would do confessions and communions. Same with the 11, uh, same with the 12, alternating. Baptisms every Sunday, uh, evening uh, Vespers at 5 with benediction, a formal evening meal then sit for what we call recreation, uh, which is coffee and tea and chatting. And then the eight o'clock Mass. So whoever had only said two Masses that day said the eight o'clock Mass with confessions and Holy Communions. And he had been a university professor and he was preaching at a kind of university level. I knew there was a kind of intellectual tradition in the church. I had been had courses in Augustine and a kind of Aquinas, but I had never seen any of that um, present in, in the liturgy. I got started getting invited out occasionally for dinner, and then after dinner, the father would sit me down in the blue parlor and say, well, I think maybe you're supposed to join us. Mm -hmm. uh, and the father was always on the lookout for kind of uh, university students and kind of vocations and things like that. So the first time I was invited was, uh, I came again to the Easter Vigil and there was a kind of reception uh, uh, after the Easter Vigil, mostly for kind of the university students who were coming around. And that was the first time I believe I, I spoke to the Father. I said to Father, okay, I give up. And he said, ah, oh, God is good, thank you. And uh, and we're going to clothe you next Sunday, which is the Feast of St. John and Paul. So I was actually in the house less than a month, and not as a, as a postulant, and was clothed. So I, th I think at that time, with only five members of the community, it's like, if we got somebody, let's grab them before it's too late. So that was uh, um, my beginning uh, in the oratory. And, uh, uh, and for me, at least, it's, everybody's vocation is different, but after being clothed, I felt at home. This is where I belong, and that's how I've felt for 40 years. So. 
things that just seemed to me uh, completely, completely right. So I was completely won over almost from the very first. Father Juvenal was a novice master, yes. We wrote the novice rule, Father Juvenal mostly, based on the London novice rule. Um, and then he became the novice master for the people who were just behind us. Uh, he would always ask about how the novices were doing and um, because he didn't have that much sort of direct contact with them a lot of the time. It was clear that, you know, that he was the, the founder and that uh, he had all the experience and wisdom and so mm -hmm. it was really the center of, of the way that the congregation grew. Several months after meeting him, I agreed to join the oratory, which I did, along with Father Paul Pearson, who now succeeds Father Robinson as the father, in the September of 1985. Father Robinson started talking to me about the idea of some sort of seminary training for the Oratorian brothers. At that time, it, the oratory was just beginning and we had a lot of new recruits, but those recruits didn't really have a clear place to go. It wasn't a great idea for them to be sent away because going away when an oratory is small means that half of the community is missing in action and we needed them around. Also, because, of an, because an oratory is a community where we have a sort of stability, it wasn't a good idea for people in their formation time to be away from the house. We wanted them to become more and more incorporated into the house and sending them away for three or four years of study really seemed counterproductive at that moment. So in the spring of 1984, we came, got put together a three-year program, at least a prospectus. And so the seminary was really designed based upon a Dominican house of studies with focus on St. Thomas Aquinas and the developments after, of course, but he was the sort of foundation. Scripture and canon law, those formed the three main bases. Because of his connections with Montreal, and because of his connections in particular with Cardinal Carter, who was from Montreal, then Canon Carter in charge of education there, knew the father well, the one who invited him here to Toronto. But because of the father's experience as the head of the philosophy department at McGill, when the archdiocese was just beginning to form a new house called Sarah House for formation and discernment for vocations, um, Father Robinson was almost immediately drawn in and asked to be the director of studies for the house of formation. And in 1986, we were asked to begin the Oratory Philosophy Program, which was exclusively for Sarah House people. In 1988, Archbishop Ambrosic, who was the coadjutor Archbishop of Toronto at the time, not yet the ordinary, but was in charge of education, told us that we wouldn't be able to continue with the subsidies that allowed us to do what we were doing financially, and suggested that we look elsewhere for seminarians. And so we began a novena to St. Catherine of Siena, our really on, only way of having any influence on anybody. If she could talk the Pope into going back to Rome when he thought the mob was going to kill him, she could twist a few bishop's arms and send us seminarians. And so on her feast day in 1988, a diocese from the United States called and asked to send seven seminarians to us. Three days later, we got a letter from the archdiocese saying that they were going to extend the funding for three more years, and the letter was dated the feast day of St. Catherine of Siena. And so that was done because of Cardinal Carter's explicit request. I think when Father Robinson was talking to him, he says, so you have all these people there. What can you do for the archdiocese? And the answer was, you can teach philosophy. Through Father Robinson's connections with the Institute on Religious Life, uh, and a, a, group of people who were, of religious, who were trying to be faithful to the rules, trying to be faithful to tradition, um, and were looking, obviously, for seminaries that were of like mind. And so we got seminarians from this little group, and that little group, and this little group, and that little group, from this group. Ultimately, that would form the foundation, the connection with the Norbertines, who would be coming much, much later. And so we started teaching philosophy in 1986 and the theological program that we've been running since 1984. And we've been doing it every year since then. I think he looked upon it, especially at the beginning, as a work um, which would keep us together. 
um, in our first years in Toronto and in his, the years in Montreal when he had been chairman of the philosophy department, he came to sort of realize that um, having you know, significant jobs that require a lot of, or most of one's time and energy outside of the community um, makes it very difficult to maintain a sort of community life when people have their interests scattered all over the map and not focused at home in the oratory and its specific work. Now, running a, a seminary is not traditionally oratorian work. Um, but several of us, and there weren't that many of us in the early years, several of us had or were in the process of getting um, PhDs, and so we had you know, a certain amount of academic qualification for undertaking seminary work. I think it was a, it was a work that was of great importance to him, um, partly, of course, because it enabled some kind of way, it expressed a continuity between his, his um, um, former professional life as a, an academic philosopher and married that with the priesthood and with the oratorian life. Um, so I think it, from those points of view, it was, it, was, it was of real significance to him that an oratorian priest should also be a teacher. And, ha and, and, and more to the point, uh, perhaps in a way, um, not just that he individually should be, but that it should be a work of the community and that the seminary would thereby have the uh, capacity to, to keep alive a certain kind of intellectual life in the oratory itself. And that was something that I think he, 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 he thought was very valuable. And he thought that it was important um, to um, be offering the kind of program that we put together um, in philosophy and that we had something to offer that would um, make a contribution to um, the church in Canada and further abroad, as we've had a number of students from outside of Canada. He, he had this sort of uh, you know, Socratic method of teaching, but basically you, it was a little bit of a game of what's the father thinking about? Because <laughs> he would ask you a question and sort of think with a blank that you were supposed to answer but you couldn't always figure out what the blank was about from the statement that preceded it. If I remember correctly, he first got me to agree to proposition X, and then several minutes later to proposition not X. I finally figured out what was going on, but not before he showed clear signs of exasperation. One of the classes that I had with him was Beatitude and the Human Act, which studied Aquinas' action theory. It's fair to say that these classes were not the high point of Father Robinson's day. At any rate, throughout the semester, he began each class by repeating one rote exercise. He would enter the classroom, sit down, sigh plaintively, and say, going to St. Bruno's. Analyze the act of going to St. Bruno's for me. The lucky student he had selected was then supposed to rehearse the steps in St. Thomas's analysis of the human act, according to Cajetan. Our class was held just before Rob Father Robinson himself took off for St. Bruno's. You had to wonder whether the exercise he had chosen to repeat, class after class, was not itself the first step in his own human act of going to St. Bruno's. First step get the students to analyze the elements of a human act. Second step, anticipate your own coming day off at St. Bruno's as they struggle with the Latin names for the parts of the human act. Third step, get yourself to St. Bruno's at last. In October of 81, uh, he purchased what we know as, as St. Bruno's, which is our country place, which is in the uh, uh, very beautiful area in, in the Hockley Valley. Uh, and he purchased it on October the 6th, 1981, and that was the kind of the Feast of St. Bruno. 
So that's why we call it kind of uh, St. Bruno's. Well, the father was very, I think it's a very deep part of who he was, that he was very adamant that the oratory should have a kind of country retreat. To imitate some of the Italian oratories, and he liked their idea of having a little villa not too far out of town or out of the city, uh, a villa in the country, he thought was a healthy and a sane idea for one's day off a week. Very much in that tradition, but also I think it was a very kind of personal thing for him because he grew up in Montreal, his father was kind of cabinet minister there, so they had a house and later an apartment in Montreal, but they always had, they had a home, uh, a kind of country home in, in Brome Lake. He thought it was a good idea that would help keep priests out of bars, uh, going off to expensive restaurants and shows, and a way of spending good, quiet time, uh, recreation time, with some of the brothers, some of the other fathers in the house. And so we looked around, we drove out, uh, had picnic lunches, uh, we wanted something an hour away from here, and we found uh, a nine to ten acre lot for sale near Orangeville. And, um, and he purchased that actually with his own money. It was a beautiful piece of land. It was a kind of 10, 10 acre cutoff on the uh, Niagara Escarpment. And he didn't, I don't think he realized at the time how rich an area it was because it was virtually right on the, the Bruce Trail. So it was a great kind of hiking area. And, uh, and so he was just very adamant that we should have that land and that country retreat. And we survived with a little house trailer there for a year or two. And then he built the house that's, that's there. He loved to cut the lawn. So I would call it the, the zen of lawn mowing. Uh, so that was his great kind of stress reliever. He would go and he would sit on the tractor and he would just mow every single bit of grass that was there. Uh, we, he loved to swim in the pond, and, and he also liked to hike, so he and I and, and also some of the other fathers used to do very kind of long hikes, so I guess when he, 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 he bought the land, he was probably in his mid-50s, and he probably hiked well into his 70s, so there's lots of beautiful hikes right around St. Bruno's, but we would often go uh, north the, on the Bruce Peninsula, uh, places like Hope Bay, and uh, beautiful kind of vistas, beautiful kind of cliffs and things like that. So he loved, he loved hiking. And then as he got older, um, it, the hiking became more of a, uh, a, a kind of a duty, a kind of fight against, a fight against the decline of his kind of physical nature. So he would, he would uh, bravely even in the middle of winter, he would bravely kind of walk to the corner, which is about two kilometers, and take his walking stick and touch the sign and come back. And that was the sign that he had, had made it. From the time I came here, the father was already talking about building a building that would house all of us, because um, there was the rectory next to Old Holy Family Parish. There was the semi-detached two houses next to that, which, had, which belonged to the parish and which were given to us for our use. Within a year or two, we bought the next house. He always had a very deep sense of kind of property and, and, and the possibilities that could be done with buildings. It was, it was kind of uncanny, but he'd look at a room and say, oh, we have to tear out this wall and tear out that wall. And like most of them, they well, no, you can't tear out the wall. The house is going to fall down. Like, what do you mean you're going to tear up the walls? And he said, no, 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 we got to just get, make this bigger. And he would get someone in. And, and it was just like, it was just like, just like, no, no, like the walls weren't even an obstacle. It's like, no, this wall has to go. We have to get rid of this wall. This has to be a bigger room. And, and so um, he just had this kind of, kind of weird instinct for kind of what actually could be done with kind of buildings that, that really required a leap of imagination that took most of us a while to, to catch up to. But once you got the builders in and the architects in, they sort of kind of could, could, could figure that kind of vision. So he was almost never content with a building the way it was. It always had to be changed and altered and expanded and, and kind of redone. 
Um, and so, you know, gradually we just redid this whole kind of area from one end to the other, and here we are, so. One thing about uh, the father in, in all of this was he's following the tradition of the oratory uh, as he learned it uh, from a lot of reading and from his times in Birmingham and in London. Um, and he was known to cite what Cardinal Newman or Father Newman said to the fathers in Birmingham, which build the house, get the house because the house is crucial to the life of an oratorian and you can, you'll, be, you'll get the support to do the church later. <laughs> if the community is there and, the, and, the, um, and you, you have your house, you'll get support to build the church later. But if you put all your efforts into getting money for the church, you might not get money for the house <laughs> afterwards. That was just Newman being very, very practical and the father following that advice. Um, one of the laymen who was a regular was bemoaning lamenting the situation in the church at that time. And Father said, well, one thing I've learned from St. Philip is the important thing for us, because we can't solve all of that ourselves, the important thing for us is to be faithful in our little corner of the world. And the layman said, which for you is rapidly becoming both ends of the block. Um, I was actually upstairs doing some accounting work and I saw all sorts of smoke coming out of a nearby building. So I got out on the, what we call the screaming balcony and I realized it was the church. June 13th, 1997, Holy Family Church burned down. Um, at some point as we were watching the fire and realized that it was gonna be out of control uh, that even if they got it out, the church wasn't going to be usable by Sunday. But we, but this was before the roof had caved in. And <laughs> but it was really quite the sight to see the church uh, burning down. All these things that uh, people had worked at to make as beautiful as possible uh, was now going up in flames. Literally, uh, we saw the water coming out of the. Uh, stairs in the front because the firemen had pumped in so much water. I think several of us thought that uh, that would make an appropriate picture for Vidi Aquam. I saw the waters coming out of the temple. Um, well, the, the father was out at St. Bruno's, our house in the country. Um, and when we started that, um, for a long time, we didn't even have a telephone there because it was a place to get away. So um, Father David called the next door neighbor and said, would you please go over and tell Father Robinson that our church in Toronto has burned down. Don't worry, nobody's hurt. There's nothing he can do. He should just stay out there. We were convinced that we would be able to raise the money for a new church uh, because the parishioners were faithful and loyal, committed to, to us. They were committed to their, to their church. And they didn't have a church now. There weren't the people could give six figure and certainly not seven figure donations, but uh, a lot of donations added up. And it was, it was very, very um, inspirational. I think that he wanted to, to make it reflective of uh, the architecture that uh, St. Philip would have uh, known and liked. Um, I know that we had uh, discussions about you know, whether we should go Gothic because that's um, a, a style that's uh, more common in North America, um, but uh, I think that his vision was St. Philip and also the very practical point, and the father was often very practical about things like this, that um, Gothic just takes way too much skill and way uh, too long to build, where it was much easier to put up what was there, and that of course uh, suited St. Philip's style better. Because St. Philip taught that sanctity consists in the breadth of three fingers. The mortificatio rationale, the mortification of the reason. Uh, obedience, without saying, I have a better way, I submit to you. And so when the father said something, or I suggested something to him, and we'd laugh and get over whatever it was. And the other was this. Because, again, in St. Philip's time, 
Uh, remember that um, oratorians uh, do not uh, take vows. And so the bond of charity is what keeps us together, which can be a very fragile bond and a very strong bond. We don't have the vows. And so an oratorian is free to leave at any time. And that does happen. Uh, if, a, if a priest wanted to remain a priest, he would have to go find a bishop or join an order and continue his, his uh, priestly ministry. A lay brother can leave. Uh, I can leave the oratory at any time. And in St. Philip's time, there was a priest who said, I can't stand this community. And those are my words. I, I'm just having too much trouble with Father so-and-so. And St. Philip would say, show me a bag of coins. And he would shake them out and say, see how shiny they are. That's because they rub against each other. And so when things were not going well, and things would go better. I find that there is in the Father something of a philosophy of community life that needs to be explored. Because I mean, his chapter addresses, a lot of them were about the spiritual life. And there's some link with what was done in, in the oratory, uh, in the little oratory. But there's the aspect of community life, of how um, our house works, and how it's supposed to work and what's required and the encouragement that he gives us and that. I think that's especially valuable because priestly life in common or some aspect of common life for priests is something that the modern church has rediscovered. That's something the father understood very well. Right and that he was able to communicate, and I think that's why um, why our house is the way that it is. He sought to have a community which was um, firmly committed to the practices of common life. and It was one of his, his frequent um, contrasts to warn against the dangers of becoming a, a kind of boarding house, where people just lived together but not according to an organized social existence sort of came and went according to their own rhythms and he wanted absolutely to avoid that so that hence his his insistence upon attendance at, at oratory in the morning oratory in the evening lunch dinner um, and the way in which our absences from the community are are sort of regulated but the, but there's, there's a very strong sense of, of, the, of the community as being that to which everything returns both daily and on a larger scale um, and that the life of the community is, is um, um, regulated fairly inflexibly by, by these commitments to common life. Um, that's one thing. And then on the other hand, uh, he, he, I think, really did value the, 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 the way in which um, individual um, interests and talents and predilections could flourish and wanted to create a community in which that was possible. So the emphasis upon common life and the practices of common life was not, I think, in his mind, a recipe for uniformity of character or affinity or interest. I think that he, he himself harbored many diverse affinities and interests um, and knew um, both in himself and in those to whom he was drawn in various ways, that it wasn't possible to, to produce one single type of oratorian personality or, or character. To really allow and, and enter into how it is that God uses one another, how God uses various members to sanctify not only ourself, but the community as a whole. And that really is kind of entering into the work of God and entering into the kind of that genius of St. Philip. And that's why kind of I can say this from past experience, the Oratorian community life is one of the most demanding because there's no escaping one another. Because that other person is a vital element. And there were many times where it was, it was very difficult, I'm sure for him, to see people um, 
people's personalities and per people's temperaments and the various kind of frictions that that might have caused. Uh, talk to the priesthood as a trade, you know, as you have carpenters and plumbers and priests and, 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 and so on. You know, why did he every, every Sunday go to hear confessions and search, you know, you're, you're getting old and feeble, you can take a break now. I'm sure you have enough fathers in this place to, to cover the booth. Um, he, he said, uh, well, I've always thought it's just part of the job. Yeah. It was remarkable how regular he would say Mass. The kind of regularity in his actions, in his tone, in his words, his phrasing. That it wasn't just a routine for him, but there was something something very important that he was entering into. He was before God. His last Mass was, was very difficult. It was very difficult to kind of get through. Um, he came into the sacristy very kind of, uh, very tired, and his nose was dripping and he just seemed exhausted. And I remember asking if he wanted to say Mass later. If he wanted to go rest and in the afternoon we could say Mass. And he was very insistent that he wanted to say Mass then. I think it's very difficult for us who are younger and for us who are just not sufficiently Christian to grasp that kind of humble heroism. Um, you just do things because it's your job. 44 years, 43. yeah. So 43 years right now. 43 now. And what are sort of your reflections on what it is for, to be an oratorian brother? What is it? It's a life of prayer, for one thing, and it's community life, uh, very much uh, bound by obedience. Uh, see, I, I think the father, um, he, um, he taught us all that, you know. He, uh, like he was. He was very faithful to St. Philip, and he conveyed that very well. Anyway, so anyways, it's, it's a life of prayer and a community. Because if it's not true what the church claims about itself, it's putting itself in the place of Christ, it's making an idol out of the Pope, it's uh, worshiping um, statues, it's uh, looking on the Blessed Sacrament as really the body and blood of Christ. I mean, those are all horrible things if they're not true. If Christianity is true, how do I know it? Where do I find it? What is it? We have to know our faith, we have to try and practice it, and uh, with the grace of God, try to become saints. And uh, sanctity, I think, is the only answer.